Welcome, welcome. It's the return to the September 3rd episode of The Trading Pit. And after a false breakout, which could have been our show, but it's actually Bitcoin, alts are seeing a fresh round of sell-off. And we're going to see if the local bottom is in. I'm Marconi Wine. Today, I'm joined by Benjamin the Well Hunter and Amit the Range Sniper from JLabs, who will unpack their analysis to show if the wells are finally going to start accumulating in September how to play range trades on Soul ETH and other alts when the market is closed on Monday, and whether the conference token 2049 is enough to catalyze price movements going into Q4. Let's hope so. Well, before we do that, we're going to kick it off with rapid fire, get Benjamin up and going, get a little energy in the room. Benjamin, are you ready? Yes. Yes. Okay. A little bit of delay for dramatic effect. Love to see it. And of course, uh, when we're looking at this right now, you may have heard these questions, but this is a fresh look on everything I'm about to ask. If you've already heard it once, let's see how he does a second time. Benjamin, Brian Armstrong and Base announced wallets for artificial intelligence. Which currency will AI choose, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Doge? Well, I, I still think they will do USDC. You still I think, think it will be programmed with... to choose stable coins. All right, so is, is there a CIA backdoor that's that's preventing them from choosing some of these other tokens? Probably, yes. <laughs> Probably, okay. The CIA uh, is <laughs> taking over. Mainly, they want to. Mainly, Coinbase wants to promote USDC and ETH. So, I think a stable coin is an easy way for them to push things. And but if not stable coins, then it will be ETH. Okay. So, so maybe there's a backdoor there that's that's going to the CIA. Most likely, it's just a, a business decision by Coinbase. I think that makes sense. Next question. We have 400 ETFs that launched in 2024. The top four most successful are all Bitcoin. And over half of the 25 are crypto-related. Is this an over or under hype stat? Uh, it's under hyped, actually. I think uh, crypto ETFs will continue to perform better than any other ETFs. The second in command probably comes from the congressman copy ETFs that comes along, wherein you can copy what the congressmen are trading, and then you know, um, yeah. I'm still everything I'm else. Still, I think it's just going to underperform. Well, I'm still waiting for that uh, that congressman trade to go on chain because at that point it's just lift off. Next one, we got America's uh, third largest bank, Wells Fargo, now offers wealth clients exposure to Bitcoin ETFs. Is this over or under hyped news event? Um, it's a little over hyped. I think it's a nice news, but it's not going to move the needle much. All right. We need to, well, Wells Fargo needs to do what it, what it did before in the mortgages and uh, kind of shuffle some paper, get a few people into these ETFs. Make it matter is what I'm going to say. Uh, next one. According to Farsight Investors, ETH ETFs have accumulated 407, negative 477 million when the sales of Grayscale ETH are included. Should ETH heads be worried? Uh, yes, they should. I, be I think they're worried by your pause, uh, your ETH dramatic pause. That <laughs> they thought that ETFs will basically bring in a lot more uh, volume, but it did not. Uh, and nobody is building much on the mainnet either. So everybody's going to L2. So they got to be worried. Mm. Well, I, I'm a little worried. We need to bring, and I think I mentioned this before in the previous stream, we need to bring back Ben Lilly to talk a little bit about supply and demand. In fact, he had a really good post in response to something Vitalik said about price stability and ways to think about moving this forward. I think after some of the commentary that came from uh, Vitalik on DeFi. So we'll definitely have to get him back, talk about that, provide a little more commentary. Last question here, though. JLAS will be present at Choken 2049 in Singapore. Besides the noodles, the great food, what are you looking forward to most for this event? Well, I'm looking to meet old friends from Singapore first because we used to be based over there back in the day. Uh, apart from that, uh, this event is very helpful engaging what various other investors are thinking, how's the developer ecosystem, um, and how things are progressing on all those fronts. Uh, so definitely looking forward to the event. Mm. 
Well, it sounds like meeting with people is definitely the best way to go. Um, if uh, people are interested in meeting with you, I, I think you're going to be there. Amit, I believe, is going to be there as well. Yep. All right. Love to hear it. Uh, what's the best way people can get in touch with you? Do they DM you here on, on X? Do they follow up on Telegram? Do they look for the bat signal when you land in Singapore? How do they get in touch? Or maybe it's a J signal going on to the ether. LBJ, they can just ping me on. <laughs> they, they can just ping on Telegram or, or Twitter. Okay, so, Telegram. So for all you out there that are interested in connecting with these guys, asking questions about what they're doing with Panda, what they're doing with JAI, or just really trying to get a good sense of uh, the markets, whales, or, or weekly <laughs> trades and sniping, definitely go check them out if you're in Singapore. Uh, invite, invite them out for some noodles. I hear they're fantastic. I haven't been. Let's get going with the show. You know, I was looking at the information this morning, uh, Benjamin, and it just felt a little bit slow. It felt like the week had been a little slow. Of course, with the U.S. markets being closed yesterday for Labor Day, that always seems to take a little bit of wind out of the sales. Um, but just looking at some of this price action, BTC, uh, last I checked, was sitting around 59K. Ethereum back at 2,500, sold all the way down at 135. You know, last week when we were talking, we were looking at the whales. They seem to be kind of uh, not really making any kind of decisive movements at the time. Now, we we didn't really, we weren't able to clear 64K, really push higher into 60, went all the way back into the 50s. Tell me, what are you seeing now? Are you seeing any kind of real accumulation? That, are the whales starting to make a move in terms of starting to buy in position for maybe a bigger Q4? Are they still waiting for a little bit of a shakeout given some of the recent price action? What What are the uh, metrics telling you? No, I do think they're still looking for a shakeout, most likely. Um, nobody is extremely risk uh, propositioned over here. They're not feeling to take, take any huge risk over here. That's why we've seen altcoins bleed down. That's why we've seen meme coins not do well. Um, and of course, the VC tokens as well. Literally, everybody is taking a pause over here. We're not see seeing stock markets run either. Um, everyone wants to wait for the NFP, CPI, and FOMC, and then gauge what they need to do. Um, there's a bit of a neutral sentiment uh, with a lot of hopium that fourth quarter will be better. Um, and also the threat of uh, potential uh, Kamala Harris presidency also weighs in on a lot of investors on the type of decision that they would make in increasing their investments into the market. So a lot of money is on sidelines, that's for sure. So walk us through what you're seeing here in terms of the chart. We have kind of four swim lanes uh, with different information. I know we've brought this up in the past, but for those who are maybe ha missed some of the latest show, can you just start at the top and work your way down what exactly you're looking at here, what you would hope to see if you were seeing some of that whale accumulation? Um, so at first, all these red lines in the chart is basically uh, anchored VWAPs from different swing points uh, in, in the previous drops and previous local tops that was made and uh, we also have the 204 over moving average all of it basically coming into a confluence between the 59k and 60k area and that's where also we have a lot of sell walls basically sitting right now which is holding up the price from moving up even when there is a bit of a buying activity that happens then uh, last week we had a bullish divergence on four hour charge there was a double bullish divergence basically form over here which was nice that gave us the pump uh, on the monday morning open and we ran up all the way to 59700 area but then this was immediately met with a lot of sell walls on the binance spot side uh, that's why you see the bid ask ratio in the near range is still the red but what was also happening is on binance spot we saw a lot of whale selling that's why you see these spikes in the 1m to 10m area um, between august 26th and 31st but during that same period on bitfinex spot there was significantly good amount buying that was happening in the same area so between the two exchanges there is a divergence <coughs> between selling and buying which is not a common behavior typically. 
and Bitfinex is trading at a premium to Binance Spot as well. Um, so it's still a little indecisive over here. I'm not so confident that we break down right away from here. Uh, so we have to wait and see. It's not a place to take uh, a confident positioning uh, in terms of uh, historicals or what we see in trade behavior as well to say that uh, you know, it's definitely a bear trap or it's definitely a bull trap. Uh, I don't think this is the place, but it is certainly the place where it's still consolidating. We probably need to see some more evidence uh, to make a decision. Well, I want you to not expand. Much going on right now. Okay. I, then, no, that's, that's good to know. It's, it's a slower market. It feels, I, I think the sentiment that people are feeling when they're wherever they are, if they're on X or they're looking at some of these other sites, it, it really is reflected in the price action, which is uh, really moving slowly. Walk us through the importance of the Bitfinex a little bit more, because I think when we usually talk about exchanges, we're talking about Coinbase, the volume coming there, we're talking about Binance. Bitfinex has been around, I think, for you know maybe it's close to a decade now. It used to be more prominent, but all the all the movement has really moved over to the other exchanges I just mentioned. What do you think the significance is of where you would see the spike coming from Bitfinex? Is that sort of a proprietary trading desk? Is that perhaps um, you know some other type of activity, or is it just really an anomaly? So. Bitfinex, um, its power comes from two reasons. One, it still has a lot of OG whales who specifically still trade there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of whales, uh, and there is a lot of money which is basically lent over there on the lending order book. So their lending books are still strong, and they do very well on lending rates. There's a lot of KOLs who basically collect money and basically lend out there. Uh, that There's a very different hype system that happens uh, on the borrowing lending side on uh, on the margin books in Bitfinex. And that never died. So the whales who were highly active, who supported Bitfinex in its tough times and grew up together with it, they never left. And keep in mind that Bitfinex uh, cold wallet is still one of the largest cold wallets uh, in, in terms of holdings uh, at par with Binance. Uh, so these two people still hold one of the largest uh, amount of BTCs and their moments matter. On top of which, Bitfinex and Tether relationship is well known. And Tether mm -hmm. um, had announced early last year that they are buying Bitcoin every quarter, right? And as we get along to the end of this quarter, like it's still September, I agree, but end of a month purchase that they are doing. Uh, you know, maybe they're doing, maybe they're not. There's no hard evidence to say that they have purchased in August during the period. But uh, I see a possibility where um, these tether purchases on, uh, on on tether's balance sheet purchases of Bitcoin probably happened during those days. It's it's hard to say, but we can speculate that um, if there is buying over there, there is some significant reasoning. But mm -hmm. to take, derive a positioning, that, that's hard because um, this type of a divergent behavior it, it can be some type of an arbitrage play. There is a you know a, a premium trading on Bitfinex, so it could be an arbitrage play. It could be some type of a, a combined basket behavior of spot perp and uh, margin borrowing lending. We do not know that, uh, but in those days there was significant activity after which there hasn't been any activity. Uh, since 31st onwards, it's been very muted activity, especially during the weekend and the past days either. Um, so I'm not sure about a breakout in either of the directions at the moment. It, it still is highly correlated to the macro behavior. Stock markets being red is also not helping. Um, so we have to wait and see how that plays out as well. Uh, it's. It's, there's just not enough evidence to say anything concrete right here. Right. Yeah. The outside forces, uh, we would definitely have an eye on them, just knowing that uh, where the Dixie goes, where uh, the rates go, where the traditional markets go, we're really going to be following them. I, I want to bring us back a little bit about some of the talking points we've had over the last couple of weeks here. Uh, you know, One of them has been that we're expecting seasonality 
right? That the summer has traditionally been slow. I, I looked at the uh, some of our previous recordings going back to April 11th, in fact, when Bitcoin was sitting at 70K. That was the first time I found when you said sell in May and go away. Uh, and, and after that, I think there was a high at 70K. In May, there was a high in 70K in June. And since then, it's been kind of downward action to, to Goblin Town. And, and so I, I think back to you calling that early on saying, hey, we should, we should have just sold a May and gone away. We talked offline about the market change. And so the market structure is shifting a little bit, causing you to, to kind of expand your net of some of the information you're looking at from an options perspective, see maybe what they're looking at, also reevaluate some of the information. What's your perspective on how the market structure is changing and how what you're looking at to see if Q4 is going to continue to be kind of uh, teed up to be a, I would say, a bull run or a continuation of the bull run? So right now, when we look at option traders in simple terms to put together, in, instead of going deep into the uh, Greeks and Roman people, uh, mm -hmm. to make it easier, options traders, it seems they are positioned more about Fridays. Uh, at the moment, the Friday expiries seem to matter for September. They are quite worried about uh, potential corrections on the NFP data and also the FOMC data. So there seems to be some positioning um, for downside um, when it comes to options on these specific news events, uh, especially. But on other days, the you know zero day expiry options, they all seem quite neutral. They don't seem way too bearish. Uh, they all seem quite neutral. So put positioning is much more on these event driven days. Um, so the market seems to be definitely worried about uh, the Fed decisions and macros and how that can affect the next few months of trading. So downside is what they're worried about. They're not worried uh, whether this breaks out on the upside or not. So it's they just don't want it to break downside. But mm. put pushing significant on those event days right now. Okay. Long so, term, term yeah. positioning right though, post September, it seems that uh, there's a alignment amongst uh, OTM traders that positioning can be bullish. So they are positioned on those far far forward expiries uh, on a bullish way. But for September, it seems there's still sentiment is quite bearish. So put traders, I mean, basically option traders, they are positioned for a bearish September. So they do believe the seasonality will continue. Although Twitter influencers want us to believe that it might not, but we have to wait and see. <laughs> It it can do another repeat of August, you know. It can pump all the way to sixty eight k, and then drop all the way to thirty five k. Uh, you know, it's Bitcoin, and yeah. together with power from uh, Pavel, we we don't know what's going to do. Uh, Papa Powell is going to be bringing out the firepower. We'll have to see if that uh, materializes. Yeah, we have to remember that many of these influencers don't necessarily have skin in the game. They're not actually taking trades, and it's easy to to talk from the sidelines when you're not in the game. Excuse me. So walk me through here. What I'm hearing is that we we really don't have a clear indication of where we're going. The wells really haven't positioned anything in September. It's still fairly neutral. From an options perspective, the options market is still worried about some down. Uh, they're buying plunge protection, basically saying, hey, we don't want to see this break down much further than it already has. Um, and so, but beyond that, as we go further out into Q4 going in October and beyond that, there's still optimism that we could see uh, a bull run uh, continuing through the rest of the year. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the silence as, yeah, a, yeah, I mean, as a yes, sir. Um, well, well, before we go and yeah. talk a little bit about range trades, I want to, can you just walk us through what exactly you'd be looking at from a whale perspective to see that momentum start to build? You know, if we go back to the chart there, you, you talked about the, the bid ask ratio, you talked about some of the spikes in buying. What exactly would you be looking for from a divergence perspective that would give you confidence that the whales are really starting to accumulate? So we received on GAI side, we received a bottom alert at 57.330 area. And then we also saw basically price move up significantly. But the problem, uh, but it did not take questions because I think the problem was there wasn't enough thick bid books 
on the bidding side and it was still quite neutral so the risk was much higher um and the other digital indices and all those things basically was not so favorable so there was no positioning taken up on the btc side as a result and mm -hmm. price moved up great you know i think we basically formed the low of monday uh, and then moved up all the way to test 60k area and the the confluence of all these rivers from <laughs> the various uh, highs and lows are basically stopping it are basically stopping it from uh you know like yeah so M making a movement okay um, one part but, but there is simply no whale positioning right now to be honest there but is when, no whale positioning when it when it waiting yeah so i guess i guess though when it is you're looking for the bid ask ratio I, well let me let me ask it a different way You've got JAI that's running um, all of these models. It's got you know eighty trade algorithms, got forty eight models, trillion data points. It's looking at here. You just have four charts up, right? Uh, which is still a lot of information. Are you are you looking then to JAI to kind of signal, hey, we're starting to see some movement. Uh, we, we've we've already signaled the the local bottom. Uh, here's a few more signals that are triggering. Are you looking here to see the bid ask ratio start to move north? Um, what exactly are you going to be looking for? Uh, there, we actually need to look for all of those. The problem is right now none of those are ringing, so no. we need to see thicker books. We need to see more uh, whale trade counts on the order flow side. Uh, when the price basically you know does a dip into the thicker order books, we need to see some significant bear traps over there, and then price needs to move up significantly from there. We need to see uh on chain uh purchases from you know our standard wallets who are basically doing a lot of purchases which we have not seen for a while and then we need to break 60k until all of these combinations happen it is time to be worried okay a wall of worry we seem to be climbing uh even though there's optimism on the horizon as we look at, into uh, october uh perhaps even after the the u.s presidential election when things will start to turn down all right, well, Benjamin, I, we'll definitely have to bring you back uh, at least next week. We may have a week off when we hit Token 2049, or maybe even have a special event. We'll have to see. But it sounds like for now, the whales aren't really buying, which leads us to the next question of, is there a trade to take when we're looking uh, at the ranges? And Amit, we're going to bring you up to talk about that. Uh, before we do that, I do want to mention, if you're interested in getting JI to execute trades for you, you can see if you qualify for that to be able to do that, um, I left the link in the chat here. We'll definitely link it in the uh, description for it as well. And I think I mentioned it before, but JAI is the powerful AI model that's sitting behind a lot of the information that Benjamin was just sharing. It's got 48 different models, 80 trade algorithms, a trillion data points. It's been running for years and has a really great track record. Of course, future results um, or past results aren't necessarily indicative of future results, but it's something that I think a lot of people I've had success with, and so it's something to check out. Definitely check out the link. Go see if, if you can sign up for that um, and definitely start doing some trading. It can help out, especially if you're going through a period where the whales are kind of unsure. It can help you preserve some capital for the time when the uh, when the seas look a little bit better. Ahmed, I want to bring you up here. Are you with us? Yes, sir. Okay. So before we kick in and talk a little about range trades, tell me, what are you excited about for Token 2049? Uh, I'm mostly in, excited about meeting more devs and figuring mm -hmm. out what's going on on the sidelines and see is there a new technology or is there a new initiative that has been pushed across the industry because at the moment there is nothing. So it will be a moment to touch base with other devs and see what's going on. Okay. Well, that's a, that, that, if you're out there, you're a dev, you want to talk to someone who's sharp, uh, who's looking to to bring some of that technology to life, definitely connect with Ahmed. Ahmed, what's the best way to connect with you? Is it Telegram? Is it X? Is it finding you in real life? How, how do they do it? Uh, Telegram is the best medium. Okay. And I imagine there'll probably be a few announcements at the uh, the J Labs Telegram channel. If you haven't already subscribed to that, definitely think you should. Uh, that's where they're going to give announcements for this show, for stuff that comes out from Espresso, some of the insights coming out from J Labs. And so forth so definitely check that out and again we'll have that in, a link in the description so amit last time we spoke you gave a master's thesis on looking at the monday play 
um, what exactly we're, we're seeing uh, for range coming out of a Monday, whether or not it hits that, it's able to sustain that and how you'd play it on Tuesday. Uh, I think it broke down a little bit last week. So I want to go over that. I also want to ask you on a week like this, where you have a week, a day off, right? We just had a holiday in the United States, which means we didn't have activity for, for five full days, or is it four full days, at least in TradFi markets. How do you start to look at the markets to, 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 sorry, to find a trade? So I'm looking at previous week lows. So you, you can clearly see that was, that acted as a resistance, uh, from the drop from the last week. So mm -hmm. from my perspective at the moment, right, there is no play, there is no trade here because it's, if it breaks down from previous week low, then basically we are looking at a gobbling down. We are looking at 57K or 52K. So I won't, I won't go in the direction, okay, how far it can drop, but it's basically, there is no trade here unless it can take on a monthly open. And from that point onwards, as Benjamin was saying, it has to go over 60K. And then there is a shot from 60k going back up to basically 63 64 and that would be the play between this area between 60 and 65 but it has to trade above 60k and hold that price before it can move up anywhere but at the moment there is no trade it's far too risky to take any trade here so i know you're really looking at sniping some opportunities when you hear though the information that uh, benjamin just shared regarding the fact that whales aren't really taking a positioning that the options market is really looking at going short or having some plunge protection does that factor in at all to how you look at your your setups are you really just looking at seeing some volume uh in the order books or order flow to really push into that that zone and then to be able to execute it's it basically act as a kind of a information that i can use or basically to be on the be more cautious or where how the market is positioning itself and then the it, the main play is the range play and if le, like benjamin just said right market is taking a punch plunge protection so i'll be cautious of any taking any uh, considerable positions here so it will be like even if if the market starts to move up can, based on the discussion if the market is still positioning itself for the move down it will be a small exposure into the market until all the uh, that they're based on the discussions it turns around saying okay the market is looking for an upside momentum then the, then it's a full go till that point it's basically based on the ranges i take small positions when you say small positions how how would someone or how, how do you think about that is that a percent of a percent typically people talk about taking one percent of their portfolio when they make a trade given the heightened risk that you're seeing here about the fact that it hasn't really moved into that go zone is that 1% of 1% or 10% of that 1%? Is that the way you think about sizing? Yeah. So the sizing, the way the way I think of the sizing is basically, I don't trade with one fat order sitting in the order book. It's basically always a range play. Even when I'm taking a percentage of the balance, it's always in terms of the percentage. It's never one trade. It's never in terms of dollars. It's always in terms of how much you're willing to risk. And based on the conditions at the moment, it would be at max 10% of the balance that to in a range so it would be if the market goes up right from 60k above so it will be a range play from 60k all the way down to 58k and that would be basically 10 to 15 percent of the balance within that range with the fat orders basically within ji what i saw was basically the way the positioning happens so there is an exponential uh the order placement so reverse pyramid that gets played out so what makes that beautiful is basically you're you're always protected towards the bottom of the range even if the market breaks down there is still you don't end up losing anything most of the times it's basically recovers runs up yeah okay I, th I think that's good perspective on how someone thinks about the amount of risk they're putting on the table i think so many people this particularly in this space where it is so easy to trade uh even without having a sophisticated risk framework they're not thinking about the max the, the amount that they're actually going in with. So I think that's definitely something anyone can consider. So that, yeah, basically, that's basically what you have to consider is based if once you're all the orders are filled and your worst case scenario comes to play, how much will you lose? So if mm -hmm. you are putting up 25% of the balance and the market breaks down, are you willing to lose 1% of that 25% balance? So that's where you should be thinking from that perspective. So it's always good to plan in advance for the worst case scenario when you're taking up the trades. 
So because it acts as a mental barrier, because it's mm. very difficult to cut a trade. And cutting a trade is something where yeah, you can spend a lot of time discussing when to cut, how to cut. And I think JI does a good job there. It, yeah, it takes a position, it sees something, it cuts, cuts the trade whenever it sees a problem. What about the person that says, listen, the whales are not accumulating. They seem to be neutral. We've continued to be in a bit of a down pattern for the last several months. Why not just take a short position and kind of play it out? Why, why is that not your default? See, taking a short position is always risky because it can turn on its head very quickly. And then basically how far you will go. It's if the market is showing, I mean, Considering the long-term uh, perspective, or when I say long-term, it's basically the three to four weeks. I won't take a short a short position here because there is a good chance based on the, all the data points that will come in at some point, there is a chance it might turn around. And this is not the place to take a short position because it's in between. If, if we see 55K breaking down, then there is a short play there, but not at the moment. It's mm -hmm. in between. Okay, so not not enough conviction there to take a short and and I and I think when I say short, I, I imagine a lot of people thinking very much almost a a one time bet, a yellow bet, saying, okay, I'm just going to short the entire market, my entire stack. I'm my my conviction's basically ninety nine percent that it's going down from here. Uh, your conviction seems to be more of we could go either way, uh, and I need to see some kind of impulse, some some type of signal that suggests which way it's going to go in the near term where I can make a play. Yeah. Okay. So you just walked through through Bitcoin, uh, your perspective on what you're looking to range trade. Is there anything else? I mean, we, we were talking offline about looking at Solana, looking at Ethereum. I think Benjamin came in hot saying he was like, no, just Bitcoin, nothing else, because it's such a slow week. What What's your perspective there? Do you, do you align to that and say, no, I'm only looking at Bitcoin during the slow weeks? Or actually, there's really good opportunities because of volatility that can happen further downstream. Maybe it's taking shorts on other altcoins. What yeah. are you looking at from that perspective? I mean, Sol, I, I'm always inter in, interested in Sol for the time being. Reason being is because from the percentage perspective, it can move move very fast and you can make some dollars at the back of it. So looking at the chart currently, right? Again, exactly like Bitcoin, it's going to test the previous week low, take the liquidity up. And then even if it runs up from, let's say from 127 to you, 135, still you got at least good chance of making how much you have five to six percent on the balance so even mm -hmm. if you take five percent of the balance and run it up here so you make something at the back of it and then if it plays back down you i mean if i'm taking a position i'll start taking a small bunt from previous week low and but that means you have to be on your desk and basically babysitting the trade but if you're looking from the swing perspective, right, then basically you have to see monthly open 135 taken price ranging above 135. Then you can have a short of quarterly open that 145 and all the way up to the trend line to 155, 160. So this is a long term trend line that I've been following uh, for Seoul on a 12 hour time frame. It has acted as resistance, like you can see every single time. So for Seoul, play. For long-term play, yeah, you go above 160 or 155, then you have a shot at 200. Otherwise, yeah, that's too far down the line, not at the moment. So at the moment, the play would be take a short position at or, or small position at previous week low, take run it up to mon Monday or monthly open, book 50% of the profit, let it run up to the quarter quarterly open and see what happens there. Hmm. That seems relatively straightforward. <laughs> so you have a bunch yeah. of bids at the previous week low, uh, looking yeah. to run up, like you said, to the monthly open and then the, the quarterly open if it's able to to move beyond that. Yeah. Are these all within the next couple of, couple of days that you're looking at from a, a range this perspective? From the week perspective. So again, this will all gets invalidated next week. Mm -hmm. Again, next week we go in with the fresh charts. So this happens Monday closes and we start drawing the charts again based on whatever we are tracking and see where it sits, what the liquidity looks like, what the order book looks like, what the whales has been doing. So it's a week on week discussion. And based on that discussion, we see how the market is shaping up. So I, I want to talk a little bit about your psychology there from the market shaping up, because I feel like even on slow weeks, you're able to analyze and find some play that you could potentially make 
And, you know, I want to contrast that with what we've talked about uh, with, with, you know, JJ, when he was on the show um, uh, several months ago, talking about waiting for those fat pitches. So I think he has, you know, very, very much a different trading style, looking at from an options perspective. But from your point of view, what is the signal that really tells you it's time to sit on your hands? Because as I just mentioned, you seem to be able to find a way to find these trades, even in weeks that are rather slow. How do you know that, hey, you know, this is actually at my, you know, my default bias, which is to do something is pushing me to take on too much risk. I don't want to do that. I really just need to be hands off this week. Yeah, basically when there is, when the market goes complete sideways, like the, this range, that's the week where you do nothing. So this, this area, when you see no volume whatsoever, that you don't see any fat trades on the order book side also. Out, specifically on the order flow side, there is nothing on the order book, and there are no mm -hmm. trades happening. There is then the order count is way too below the average. So when I say order count on a basic on a good day, you see around kind of a 30, 40 k trades coming in per minute, but sometimes it goes down to one k a minute. So when you see that, that means there is no interest from anybody. Nobody wants to trade. So that means. Order books by default, that means order books are very thin and market can break down or break up at any point of time. So that becomes too much, too much of a risk to handle. So mm. those days I want to stay out of it. When, when the market's taking liquidity off the table, really just not showing that there's enough, uh, it's really shallow ponds of liquidity. That's the time when you walk away and touch yeah. grass. Yeah. Well, how has that looked over the last summer? Uh, was mentioning earlier, about how all the way back in April, Benjamin was talking about sell a man, go away. Uh, and then of course we've, I, I think I mentioned when I looked at the information, we've gone from 70 K all the way where we are today, really not a whole lot of movement. Do you think you would have been better off having sell, sold a man, taking more time, uh, maybe to watch some cricket or the, or Paris Olympics, or are you, are you happy that you stuck it out? Cause th there were some really good plays over the summer. Exactly. So I don't, I, like we discussed many times, I don't see the long plays. I see week on week play. So always on my terminal, looking at what is interesting for this week. If anything is popping up on my screener, pick up from that point of perspective and put it on the charts and see what the ranges are looking like, what, and then go to order flow perspective. So seasonality is for whales, but for the mm -hmm. traders, it's basically ranges. Seasonality is for the whales. They go and move around the beautiful oceans. I like that. All right, so that's a good perspective on it. Well, are there any other tokens you're looking at? I mean, I think Solana keeps on popping up in your radar. BTC is an obvious one. We, I know we've talked about Ethereum in the past. Last week, we talked about Aave. Um, is there anything else that's kind of caught your eye? Maybe JAI's pulled up that you've um, that you found interesting that maybe you're analyzing a little bit further? Uh, we looked at Dodge very briefly but there is nothing there mm. there is nothing apart from the meme meme coins are bleeding so there is nothing on from i mean we looked at whiff whiff is again there is a play but very risky at the moment so there is apart from btc and soul there is no other play yeah okay well there's nothing wrong with that as well it's an honest assessment <laughs> but <laughs> Where to actually find some high conviction plays if, in fact, you hit the ranges you're talking about, uh, and then some good psychology on that. So, I guess before we wrap this up, is there anything else you'd want to share from a range trade perspective? No, there is nothing else happening. Hopefully, something gets picked up this week. Okay. Well, we'll have to see. I mean, the, the next couple of weeks are going to be interesting. Uh, we have some some high flying events. It's possible that this this month we're going to have some actual uh, rate cuts. In fact, I think I mentioned offline, I was reading something at City was calling for 50 basis point cuts. It's all speculative at this point. No one really knows exactly what the Fed's going to do. Anybody who's saying the Fed has to make cuts at this point, I think uh, really is, is saying something with uh, a lot of conviction that maybe is a little bit more hot air than anything else. The, the Fed will do what it's going to do. We'll see if there's some rate cuts. We'll have the jobs report that is coming out, the non-farm uh, payrolls. And then, of course, we have the election coming out uh, in, uh, in November in the United States, which could have a big impact. And so a lot of events over the next couple of months that we're going to be looking at beyond even token 2049. So I think with that, we're going to wrap it up. It's going to be a, a, a shorter shorter show today. I want to thank everyone for for joining us on the uh, the second or third live stream. I'm not sure which one it ended up being. Really appreciate you joining us here. We'd love to have you uh, ask any questions that you have. This is the place to do it. It's here on X. 
uh, going forward, this is where we're going to be doing the live stream. Uh, there's a couple of reasons uh, for that behind the scenes. But if you want to join the live stream, you want to ask questions and engage, X is the place to do it. Of course, we'll have a show, uh, the recorded version going out uh, the next day where you can see that. But um, Ahmet and Benjamin, thanks so much for jo joining uh, me today on the trading pit. Look forward to having you guys come back next week, see if the whales are moving, see what uh, options there are for uh, trading the ranges. And with that, I think I'll leave it with the same PSA I leave every single time. Have some dry powder. Clearly, this week is telling you that right now is a good time to maybe be sitting on a little stack of USDC, something you can deploy as the market makes a little bit more conviction. But with that, go have some fun. Enjoy the last couple of weeks of summer. This is Marconi White signing off. Thank you.